Welcome to another Nature Trek podcast where we bring wildlife to you in your living room. In this episode, travel without restrictions, the epic flyway journey of migratory raptors with tour leader Simon Tonkin and I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's marketing manager, normally based in the Nature Trek head office, but this podcast is coming to you just down the road from my home recording studio in Alton. Now, joining me today is Simon Tonkin. He's a Nature Trek tour leader from Plymouth. Growing up, his first birding haunts were rubbish tips, sewage outfalls, and fish factories. <laughs> but then he went on to fulfill a boyhood dream of working for the RSPB, where he worked for 15 years, the majority of his time spent being working in farmland bird conservation. He's also lectured in ornithology, co-launched Operation Turtle Dove, and has worked as a conservation manager for Conservation Grade, working on groundbreaking projects in Spain, Portugal, but also in Central America, Morocco, Senegal, and the Gambia. He now lives in the epicenter of migration at the Straits of Gibraltar, working on a variety of conservation projects and tour leads throughout the year for Nature Trek. And he's joining us now on the line from Gibraltar. Simon, welcome. How are you? Hi, Sarah. Hi. That's uh, quite an introduction. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I quite like it when people introduce me about uh, my old birding haunts being rubbish tips and sewage outfalls. <laughs> in fact, I was actually introduced... Um, um, once as having no discernible talents apart from hanging out at sewage outfalls and uh, rubbish tips. So that was a great introduction. Thank you. Oh, blimey. <laughs> no problem. Um, so, Simon, you're here today to talk to us about raptor migration. Um, so, of course, you're situated in an ideal part of the world for this. So, firstly, can you tell us a bit about where you live? Can you paint a picture for our listeners, perhaps not at the moment necessarily with the lockdown, but what it's normally like uh, in the streets of Gibraltar? Absolutely. Uh, well, it's one of the most awe-inspiring places to live. I, I love living here. I've had an affinity with this place for a very, very long time, and living here was a natural progression for me. Um, we live in a village uh, called Fasinas. It's a beautiful village in the, in the mountains, just by the coast, uh, in the Straits of Gibraltar. And this is the narrowest point between Europe and Africa. It's only 14 kilometers wide. So it's a really good place where bird migration, but other migration as well, of other species and taxa focuses down into this narrow point with a narrow sea crossing. So it's a really, really good place to witness visible migration of birds, but also cetaceans, moths, butterflies, a whole gambit of different things. And the scenery here is beautiful, really friendly people like me. I'm very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just a really great place to be. So is that the main uh, factor, would you say, about what makes that area so great for migratory birds? The fact that that channel is so narrow that it just makes it a very accessible pathway? Sure, uh, because particularly the soaring birds like the raptors and storks, they really hate the sea because as soon as they drift out over the sea, there's no thermals and they start losing altitude quite quickly. So what the birds are doing here is they're thermaling up using the, the mountains and the hillsides on the coast, getting as much height on the thermals as possible and then drifting out over the sea. And as soon as they go over the sea, they start dropping. It's a real challenge for them. It sounds like it. Well, that's not that wide. It should be easy but it's a real challenge for them, even the 14 kilometers, mm. just to drift all the way. In perfect conditions, they can soar up, thermal up, and just drift all the way to the European coast or the African coast in the autumn. Normally what happens, however, uh, we, we have either an easterly, the Levante, or the westerly wind, the Poniente wind. So these guys are battling, getting blown off course, so they're not crossing necessarily at the narrowest point because they're getting pushed outwards either into the Atlantic or into the Mediterranean mm. and if they get pushed too far then they drown they they don't make it but in, what invariably happens they thermal up drift out and then use the headwind to actually come into the headwind to just gain a little last lift to take them across the finishing line it's um it's something really to watch it to watch these birds making this crossing and the different species using different techniques to make that crossing. It, it is real edge of the seat stuff. It's uh, better than any Netflix drama, that's for sure. <laughs> 
So there's no doubt that this is a vital pathway for an enormous number of species. You've mentioned um, raptors. I mean, we're now into spring. So what birds are passing through right now? Where, where are they coming from? Where have they been wintering? So at the moment, uh, well, from, from my house here, from, from lockdown, we're able to see some of that migration. And at the moment, we've been watching um, short-toed eagles and booted eagles, both coming up from the Sahel region of Africa, where they've spent the winter. Um, and they, they've crossed out from Morocco into Europe. They've made that 14 kilometers. And they're going up into, into other parts of Spain, as far as France, to breed. Um, I, I think species like those are really, really interesting. Uh, the booted eagle, for instance, it spends two months of its life traveling every year. Um, and I know a lot of people listening to this will really enjoy traveling and maybe right now be very envious of that booted eagle ma making that journey unhindered without borders. Uh, added to that at the moment, what real splashes of noise and color as well with the European bee eaters coming. And when they come, they come in big numbers. So I know many people have been on nature trek trips and seen them at their breeding sites and that's really cool. But to see literally flocks of hundreds of them crossing across the Straits of Gibraltar, making this huge amount of noise, that's, it's phenomenal. It's really good. And they're coming now, just the first ones and the first swifts as well. So hopefully those swifts will be on their way to you too. Wow. Yeah, I've been meaning to get some swift uh, nest boxes up around my, uh, my house, actually. So hopefully we'll have some very shortly. Um, I was going to ask you what the favoured weather conditions are for peak raptor passage, but you, you just answered that. So presumably the worst things that they could be um, uh, encountering would be cold, wet and, and little winds or even too windy. Um, and is climate change affecting that at all? Have you noticed? Um, climate change is certainly shifting migratory pattern. So some birds are able to keep up with that. So um, milder winters mean that some birds are actually overwintering more. Um, and some birds aren't able to keep up with that. So honey buzzards, for instance, they, they migrate up from, from Africa. Uh, by the time they reach the breeding ground, they're missing the peak of their food resource as well. So uh, that, that's kind of because of that outer kilter with, with the changing climate. The perfect conditions for crossing here would be really very little wind, but probably a little bit of a headwind. And we rarely get a northerly wind here, but it sometimes happens, certainly very rarely in the spring. But if the birds are coming across from, uh, from Africa, as they are in the spring, then a headwind is really good because that just a gentle headwind will give them a little bit of lift. The worst thing is a crosswind, either from the east or the west. But some birds, some species in particular, I'm amazed at how they still make that crossing. Black kites in particular, I never, I, I've never seen raptors like black kites. They're often the one that people overlook, but I never overlook black kites because they're so strong. I've seen them making the crossing in a force eight uh, easterly wind. Uh, totally unreal. That drive to get back to the breeding grounds is so strong. That's, that's phenomenal. And... Uh, do they use any specific landmarks to guide them from A to B, uh, you know, rivers, towns, cities and things like that? Uh, I think certainly the topography of the coast here is really distinctive. So we have um, on the Moroccan coast, the Jebel Musa, which is this big higher, higher, it's actually one of the pillars of Hercules. The other one being Gibraltar, which is really close to us here, or Jebel Tar. Um, so Jebel meaning mountain or hillside uh, in Arabic. So those high, high um, mountains or hillsides are probably really important, particularly to soaring birds, because as soon as they get to the coast, they're absolutely, they're gulating, they're panting, really exhausted. But what they want to do is just pop up on a nice thermal. And I, I always think there must be a real joy when they make that. And there's a nice thermal waiting for them to just get up onto. And they climb in seconds. And they're, um, while they've been really close, they're a mere dot in a few seconds, less than a minute, they can be really, really high. So that, that they're probably heading for those features. Mm. I, I remember reading uh, about a satellite tagged honey buzzard, uh, which was on its spring migration and it reached the northern tip of Egypt. This is a few years ago. 
reached the northern tip of Egypt, and instead of crossing the Mediterranean right in front of it, it navigated east along the coastline, passing Israel, Lebanon, and most of Turkey. And then it continued due north on the same bearing as it had done, um, so to reach to North Africa. So was this potluck, or was it use of landmarks, or is there more behind it, do you think, than we might first think, such as sensing the Earth's magnetic field or anything like that? So it's a good question. I don't think we fully understand as yet, but one of the things that's really opening this world to us is the use of telemetry. We work with a, a organization here called Fundacio Migres. We, we work really closely with them. When we're not guiding, we're actually counting with them, monitoring the migration. But one of the things we're also able to do um, is uh, radio and satellite tagging. And that's shown um, some of the things that we, we supposed before have been completely obliterated. We, the, the changes in migratory route, um, birds like uh, short-toed eagles, for instance. Um, the Straits of Messina uh, when, for the Italian breeding uh, short-toed eagles is too wide for them. And we actually found this from really recently, only in the last few years, from telemetry work that those birds go up through the landmass of Italy, turning, going down through France to make it here into the Straits of Gibraltar because this is the place they can cross. And they're quite a big, long-winged raptor. Mm. So, you know, they really struggle with powered flapping flight. So crossing the Straits of Messina into Africa is really difficult. But we've always assumed that's what all of them did. Well, these, these birds, these individuals actually came up and did uh, up through the landmass and, and made the crossing here. So some of them have to come here. Well, it's not easy for them at all, is it? Um, and, and what are the main obstacles, uh, other than just the, the distance of the sea, um, which might affect their migration? So the main challenges, actually, just to expand on obstacles, challenges. And are there uh, conservation solutions for these? Yeah, so... Um, the, there are three main challenges to, uh, and this is probably true for all long distance migrants. Um, hunting can be a challenge. Uh, we, we don't have that issue here in the Straits, but um, the, the raptors and uh, migratory birds are protected. Um, but uh, in other uh, migratory bottlenecks, certainly hunting is a pressure. It's probably not the main driver of decline for most species, however. It's probably a contributory factor. But one of the big ones is land use change around agriculture and the issues around agriculture on both their breeding grounds and on the wintering grounds, but also along the flyway as well. So these guys have refueling stops, important refueling stops um, that are being changed radically. Um, due to agriculture and other things like urbanization, um, afforestation as well as deforestation as well is a really important factor. So add all those things up, they're a real big driver to, to declines. So the solutions are more extensive agriculture, more traditional type agriculture, um, providing um, homes for wildlife, but also um, it, it, it to be uh, joined up as well, not not isolated in country and I think that's one of the things that we've uh, conservation's often struggled with is working across border along flyways um, collaboratively and that's what's really important to particularly long distance migrants. Mm. And presumably these conservation projects are easier said than, than done in terms of getting members of the public on board with it as well. Do you find that there's a, a resistance or is there a growing love of the, the bird species uh, in Gibraltar? Like there is in the UK, a lot of people are becoming more aware of their conservation over here. Is, is that reflected in Gibraltar or not? Um, in, in the Straits, it's, uh, I, I think certainly here in, um, in Spain and, and Gibraltar as well, I think there's a growing, I think there's always been an understanding of migration. I'll be stood in the, the queue at the supermarket and some, somebody will randomly turn to me and tell me, hey, it was a really good day of migration today, not knowing that I'm into watching birds. But, and I think that's really nice. People talk about it like the weather here. Wow, did you see all those storks yesterday? You know, that kind of thing. So I think there's already that understanding, that, that appreciation. Um, and 
I think people are aware of the situations and the problems facing the species, but maybe not entirely. So we look at it very, we, we often look at conservation, what's happening in our own backyard, but not where those birds are going to or coming from. Mm. And I think that's more difficult. And that's a, that's a, a, a bigger pe- picture that we need to paint and tell people to get an understanding so they, they ho- hopefully that leads to funding of con- vital conservation work in, in countries that don't have funds to deliver or don't have protected area, for instance, which we're really blessed with here in Europe. Mm-hmm. And um, are there any initiatives to get those people, those members of the public who are interested um, in actually engaging with the migration? For example, in uh, Batumi in, in Georgia, where of course you can view the spectacular southbound migration of raptors, they encourage volunteers to count them. Um, is there any involvement like that where you are? Yeah, so we, we have a brilliant organization, I uh, mentioned them, uh, Fundacion Migres, and uh, uh, together we monitor the migration, but people can volunteer to von- uh, view the migration counts, e- each individual honey buzzard coming through. Uh, one day I counted 11,000, and believe me, when you close your eyes at night, all you see is honey buzzards, which is actually really nice. But uh, yeah, people can volunteer for, for that that program, particularly in the autumn, um, which is when we're the, the busiest here. And uh, yeah, you can be stationed at a watch point. And one of the good things about that work is this is quite a windy area. The, the coast here is quite windy. We get, as I said, the Levante, the easterly wind, or the Poniente, the westerly wind. And that means that we have uh, lots of wind turbines, which are really good for renewable energy, but not so good for the soaring birds that are crossing. But what we've been able to do with Fundacio Migres is train uh, ornithologists working for the wind farm companies, as well as Migres themselves, to be able to switch those turbines off in peak migration periods. And uh, that, that means when, when we spot birds coming through a, a wind farm area, we're actually able to switch the turbines off, um, allow them to pass, and then switch them back on. And that process takes around two minutes so uh to put this into some context so for the for the energy uh, requirement for andalusia which is the biggest region in spain uh, it produces around about 18 percent of the required electricity these wind turbines now switching them off uh, affects that output by less than one percent but wow. makes a huge huge difference to mm. migratory raptors one of the things we, we know less about is the effects on bats and other species like that, but we certainly know that we're able to make a real change for uh, migratory raptors um, coming through those areas and still have our renewable energy. And that's great to hear that there's so much uh, uh, involvement that the, the members of the public can, can get involved with and engage with. And uh, I don't suppose there's any educational work with children in the region. Is that I'm thinking of the work carried out by BirdLife Malta, for example, to introduce introduce the children to birds, even if their parents may be out shooting them. Um, is there anything like that out there where children can get involved and they're actively encouraged to to enjoy their local wildlife? Yeah, we have um, we have a program of work with Fantasio Migres, um, going to local schools and the schools coming to. Um, the the um, the center the Migre center on the coast here, which we call the observatory. Um, so people, uh, children can see the migration firsthand, and also experience uh, um, some of the stories behind the migration, which is really important. Uh, one of the other things we have as well is uh, we have. I, I should give a shout out to Bartolo as well, who's a, a an eagle owl, and he was shot not here in the Straits, but um, he was shot in the wing, and so he can no longer fly. But ha- actually, he's a really good educational tool, um, which we, we we use him. He has to earn his, his food uh, to inspire the children, but also he actually enables us to trap the black kites. So um, the black kites want to mob Bartolo because they see him as a predator. And so they come, and then we're able to trap them and fit the telemetry to Bartolo as well. So... Um, his history is really sad. His, uh, he should be in the wild and he should be enjoying the wild, 
but he's a real good conservation tool for us from a scientific point of view, but also from that engagement point of view as well. Well done, Bartolo, an unintended career in conservation. Yeah. Good, good for him. So what are you most looking forward to after the lockdown is over, whenever that may be? Well, hopefully uh, spring migration is still very much in uh, full flow here. Uh, actually, it rarely ends migration here. It starts, our spring migration starts in February and ends in June. And it's kind of still a trickle into July as well. And then our autumn migration starts in July and goes all the way through to December. So what I'm really looking forward to, because it, whenever it does end and we're able to get out, is just being out on the coast and seeing those birds make that, that uh, promise of return and returning to, to here and to Europe and uh, just the freedom of it all. It's just amazing. And the battles they go through as well. Mm. Uh, so I really, really love seeing these soaring eagles crossing the straits with bee to swifts coming as well. And getting out on the sea as well, seeing the cetaceans here in the straits. Fabulous numbers of long fin pilot whales, bottlenose dolphins, striped and common dolphins, all resident here, as well as migratory sperm whales and other species as well. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. That should be really good. <laughs> You're making me very jealous. That's quite, a lot, that's quite a lot of things to look forward to. You've got an awful lot to look forward to. And haven't we all, haven't we all, once this all ends and lockdown is lifted and we're able to resume traveling again, um, the world will still be there and the species will still be waiting for us to come back to and enjoy once more. So, um, yes, we can't wait for that. And until then, we can keep enjoying our armchair travel um, by listening to podcasts like this, reading wildlife books and perhaps watching reruns of David Atom programs. But uh, Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, stay safe, everybody, as well. I hope to see you soon out here. To join Simon on a nature trek tour, you can see his upcoming trips on his profile page on our website, the link to which is displayed on your screen now. And to listen to more of our podcasts, just go to our podcast webpage at www.naturetrek.co.uk forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.